Hello, I'm Peter Baxter, as Editor of Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology. It's a pleasure to introduce this podcast. In it, we'll be discussing the paper, Screening for Childhood Mental Health Disorders Using the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, The Validity of Multi-Informant Reports, which is by Johnson, Hollis, Marlowe, Sims and Volker in the May 2014 issue of the journal. It's going to be discussed by Dr. Samantha Johnson, who's Senior Research Fellow in the Department of Health Sciences at the University of Leicester, UK, who's the first author, and Dr. Carly Travode, Senior Research Officer, Victorian Infant Brain Studies, Murdoch Children's Research Institute, Melbourne, Australia, who's also written a commentary on the article. Please, can we start with you, Sam, to outline the paper and the background? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Peter. So just to put this paper in a little bit of context to start, I'm a developmental psychologist and my research interests are in studying the long-term development of children who are born prematurely. And for this kind of research, we often assemble large birth cohorts and then we follow these children up from birth through childhood and adolescence to assess a wide range of their developmental outcomes. And one of these kinds of studies which I've been involved in for a number of years now is the Epicure study. And this is a national study here in the UK in which we recruited all the babies that were born less than 26 weeks of gestation across the whole of the UK and Ireland in 1995. And we've been following up those children ever since. And for these kinds of studies, ideally we'd assess mental health outcomes using diagnostic psychiatric evaluations. But these are very costly and the practical issues of using these kinds of diagnostic tests on such a large scale, especially where you've got widely geographically dispersed cohorts, are rather prohibitive. And so for this reason, we tend to rely more and more on use of behavioural screening questionnaires that can be completed by parents or teachers to tell us about mental health outcomes in these cohorts. And one of these questionnaires that's used quite frequently, particularly in the UK, but also throughout the world, and I think Dr. Travaux has used these as well, and that's the Strengths and Difficulties Questionnaire, or SDQ. And it's widely regarded that when you use these screening questionnaires that you should collect data from multiple informants, so both in the case of children, both parents and teachers. But we're not quite sure how best to use these data in our analyses. So whether we should look separately at the results of teacher reports or parent reports, or whether it's better to aggregate these data together to give us the best estimates of the likely true prevalence of disorders in these populations. And recently in the Epicure study follow-up at 11 years of age, we were fortunate enough to be able to use the SDQ and a diagnostic psychiatric evaluation to give us diagnoses on all of the children we assessed. And that's what this paper reports, essentially, is the results of comparing the parents' and teachers' reports on the SDQ with a formal diagnostic assessment of psychiatric disorders. And in a nutshell, what we found was, for research purposes, when we want to get the most accurate estimates of the prevalence of disorders, we would use pervasive ratings. So that's where both the parent and the teacher rated the child as having a clinically significant problem on the SDQ. And this gave the best prevalence estimates of the likely proportion of children with disorders. So in effect, two heads were better than one. But we also noted that the use of the aggregation method really differed by the purpose of screening. And that for clinical use, we might want to use combined ratings where either the parent or the teacher identifies the child as having a problem so that children with significant difficulties who might warrant intervention aren't missed. Thank you. I was just wondering if you could comment on how the use of the SDQ might vary according to use in clinical or research settings? Yeah, sure. And actually, I think that's what this paper has hopefully highlighted in that the purpose of using these behavioural screening tools and the way that you aggregate the data depends on the purpose for which you're using it. So for clinical use, these screening tools would probably be part of a larger battery of clinical observations and developmental or behavioural assessments. And so it wouldn't be used in isolation. And children who were screened positive on these general mental health measures are likely to be followed up with diagnostic assessments. But in contrast, In research, such as in the Epicure study and many other large-scale trials or in epidemiological surveys, these instruments are often used in isolation to 
give an estimate of the prevalence of disorders. And so those children are not followed up usually with a diagnostic measure. And so for those purposes, we want to get the best or the most accurate prevalence estimate. And what we've shown from these data in the paper are that using pervasive ratings where both informants agree the child has a difficulty is probably the most optimal way of aggregating the data. Great. I was just wondering if we're doing a study to understand the prevalence of a disorder in order to then justify the need for early intervention with premature children or extremely premature children, should we use the pervasive or combined parent and teacher ratings, do you think? Or do you think that we're always going to say that if we have both parent and teacher ratings, that's the best way to move forward? I think that brings up this important point that the use of these questionnaires or the way you analyse the data really varies by function and is disorder specific. I think for an intervention study where we want to identify children who might fit the criteria for receiving treatment or, or an intervention programme, then using pervasive ratings, whilst it does give us the best estimate of the prevalence of disorders in a population level, in fact, the sensitivity of using those ratings is often quite reduced, and that means that there'll be a number of children who have false negative screens. And so these children might have significant difficulties but are not picked up with pervasive ratings. And therefore, for intervention programs where we don't want children who have difficulties to miss out, it might be more pragmatic to use combined ratings, so taking either a parent or a teacher report where the child is identified as having difficulties to use for criteria for entry into an intervention program. I was also just wondering, Dr Johnson, if when we think about the SDQ, we know that we have the total difficulty score and also these individual domain scores. And I was just interested to know whether or not the total difficulty score on the SDQ was more predictive of psychiatric outcomes that you studied compared with the individual domains of the SDQ. So, for example, if we're using the SDQ in research as an outcome measure, whether we can be confident that the proportion of children, for example, who score abnormally on the emotional difficulties domain truly reflects the actual proportion of children who would be diagnosed with an emotional disorder. So in our paper, we've looked at the correspondence between screening positive on the subscales of the SDQ and the particular category of disorders. So whether you have a positive screen for emotional disorders reflects the true prevalence of children who have, who have a, a diagnosis. We looked at whether the total SDQ score predicted an overall risk for psychiatric disorder, so combining all the disorders. But we didn't look individually whether, how it corresponded with the risk of separate disorders. So whether the total SDQ score was an accurate predictor of risk for emotional disorders, or ADHD or conduct disorders, for example. And so that's not something that's in this particular paper, but we could in fact look at. And just to add to that point, that in our paper, we use the published cutoff that are um, available online that were developed from the standardization sample. But actually we might find that a different cutoff might be more appropriate in an extremely preterm population to reflect the different distribution of symptoms in these children. I was also wondering about the actual different psychiatric disorders that you studied and wondered whether or not you could discuss whether the specific diagnoses where you have both a parent and teacher report might not actually be necessary or alternatively those disorders where you found that helmets actually did provide the best information? Yeah, sure. That's a really interesting point, in fact, and it probably relates to the reasons why some of the estimates of diagnostic accuracy were better, were, were disorder specific, so were better for some disorders um, than others. So we used a number of ways of analysing agreement between the behavioural screening tools and the diagnoses in this study. So we looked at Cohen's Kappa values, we looked at predictive values of sensitivity and specificity, and also we used logistic models to explore the contribution of both parent and teacher ratings to the prediction of disorders. And in each case, the results were quite clear for ADHD and for conduct disorders that teacher ratings added significantly more information to parent ratings alone and that using pervasive ratings where both the parent and the teacher agreed the child had difficulties on the SDQ were the best estimates of prevalence of those disorders. 
And essentially that is likely because for diagnoses of ADHD and conduct disorders, pervasivity is required that symptoms need to be present in more than one context, such as both at home and school. And so it's ostensible that multi-informant ratings that will have the best agreement in diagnosing these kinds of externalizing conditions. But for emotional disorders and autism spectrum disorders, pervasive ratings are not particularly necessary. And in fact, our results were not quite as clear cut for these diagnoses. So we found that pervasive ratings have the best diagnostic accuracy, but in the logistic models, teacher ratings didn't add significantly over parent ratings alone. And so for those disorders, in fact, parent ratings alone might be better at identifying children who have significant difficulties and certainly for intervention programs. I was also particularly interested in one of the comments you made in your discussion about the age of the child and how that might be an important factor when you're looking at the results and also in recommendations for future studies in this area. Um, for instance, you mentioned that you didn't think that teacher ratings might be as helpful for adolescents or that we didn't know whether they would be as helpful. But I was just wondering also about younger children and whether or not you think the same pattern would be found in terms of not having always an available second informant for younger children who aren't in informalised care or school yet. So whether or not parent alone ratings would be more useful for these children. Yeah, sure. I think that is interesting. And for adolescents, certainly teacher ratings would be helpful, um, particularly for ADHD. But we all know it's much more difficult to gather these and interpret these because at secondary school here in the UK, children will typically have multiple teachers for different subjects. So the question is, who would the best informant be in that case? Would it be a form tutor or um, a subject-specific teacher? So it's more difficult with adolescents. And of course, for adolescents, self-report, and particularly for emotional disorders, would also be very important. But you do raise the point also about younger children. And I think for those children, preschool, that's also more problematic in the identifying who the most appropriate informant will be. So some children will be in nursery care or in daycare and they might be particularly able to report on the child's behavioural outcomes. But certainly if they're not in daycare or in nursery, then it's going to be more difficult to find an appropriate informant. So potentially then, particularly for preschool children, parent ratings are likely to have greater predictive accuracy. And I think, if I'm right, that's something that you've shown in some of your studies using the infant-toddler social-emotional assessment at two years of age, that these have pretty good specificity for problems later in childhood? Yes, we did actually find that there was quite a strong relationship with that, which is encouraging and also, I guess, provides some evidence that parent report is quite stable over time or it has good predictive value. I know that we're both very interested in the clinical implications and the wider implications of understanding the developmental pathways of children who are born preterm. And I was just wondering whether you could just talk a little bit about why the results from your study are particularly important for extremely preterm populations and the Epicure study in general, why those results are so important. Why is it so important that we understand the true prevalence of mental health and behavioural disorders in these children? I think obviously you'll, you'll agree that screening for mental health disorders in preterm populations is really important for both clinical and research purposes. And it's something I think we're aware of more than ever now in recent years. It's not just the Epicure study. I know that yourself, uh, Dr. Dufault, have published in this area that children who were born extremely preterm or very preterm are at far higher risk for psychiatric disorders than children who were born at term. And in the Epicure study at 11 years of age, where these data in the paper were collected, we found that 23% of children at 11 years of age were assigned a diagnosis of a psychiatric disorder. And this was compared with 10% of children roughly in, the, in a term-born control group. And that, of course, is similar to the rate of disorders in the UK Child and Adolescent Mental Health Survey. But more than that, if we actually took on board the results of these screening measures and other measures of symptoms of behaviour problems or emotional problems in these children, in fact, 
almost one third had some degree of behaviour or emotional problems that were impacting on their daily life. So there's a significant proportion of children who have problems that are below the clinical threshold, but which may nonetheless impact upon their daily function. And so it's really important to try and understand what might be the antecedents of these difficulties, what the causes might be, but also clinically because these disorders are treatable and they may often be overlooked if they're seen to be part of the child's prematurity. And so research into the prevalence of mental health problems is crucial not just for understanding the long-term neurodevelopmental consequences of preterm birth, but also for raising awareness of the kind of problems that teachers and parents may need to look out for and for informing service planning and provision for child and adolescent mental health services so that we're providing the most appropriate long-term support for this growing population of children. I'd just like to say thank you for the opportunity, Dr Johnson, to read and discuss this important paper. I think it has a really important message that clinicians and researchers need to understand and highlights the importance of following up and assessing these high-risk children as they go through school and beyond. It's my pleasure. Thank you very much and thank you very much for your input. We've now come to the end of our podcast. Many thanks indeed to Dr. Johnson and Dr. Vode for an insightful and fascinating discussion with obvious clinical implications. I hope it will allow listeners to get more out of the article as a result, as I certainly have. And just to remind our listeners that the article is Greening for Childhood Mental Health Disorders Using the Strength and Difficulties Questionnaire, the Validity of Multi-Informant Reports by Johnson et al. in the May 2014 issue.